a big hello to all my movie hunters today i have a very special guest it's dr landon ashworth what's interesting about landon is that he's a man of many talents for example he is a uh, yeah 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 <laughs> he's got the phd in astrophysics he's a writer an actor a director a pilot golfer member of mensa which that makes him the smartest person of this channel present company included all kinds of stuff the list goes on and on so today we have a lot of topics to cover so Landon, it's a pleasure to have you here thank you for accepting my invitation it's amazing to have someone like you here the the pleasure is all mine as they say thank you so like we said you are a man of so many talents of so many areas of interest how do you choose the, the one that uh, is the most important for you to focus on at the moment I would say that uh, one must constantly be juggling what is uh, prioritous in time. So uh, what I always say is every single second of my day, because my brain is very autistic, I'm because I'm autistic, uh, I'm constantly juggling priorities and priorities throughout the day constantly shift. So if something is time sensitive, like I'm on fire and I need to put myself out. Well, that's going to jump right at the top of the list. If it's a book that I really want to read, that might be at the very bottom of the list, unless there's a book report due, and then it hops to the top of the list. So you know, life is all about uh, determining what's important in the present moment and chasing uh, that priority. So I'm just constantly reprioritizing um, what is important in the moment, and I live uh for the moment uh while also knowing that some things take uh a gargantuan amount of work over the course of time uh you can't have instantaneous success as a screenwriter or a director today but if you constantly work on developing and honing your skills then eventually uh uh someone will say what do you want you know it's really funny i was at this um q a with steve martin and steve martin said that he was banging on the doors of hollywood for a decade just banging on the door just hoping somebody would let him in and then finally just one random day someone from hollywood opened up the door and said what do you want and if he hadn't spent the last 10 years honing what he was doing when they opened up the door he would have been like i'm steve martin make me famous but instead he could be like hey what's up juggle 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 joke 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 juggle, juggle. by the way i did this and blah, 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 blah. so hollywood has all but ignored me for literally my entire career i've had micro wins i've been a recurring on a television show here i've worked with will ferrell here i've had a conversation with dana carvey here i've so on and whatnot but in the great scheme of things i haven't accomplished a single goal that i have set out to but i'm just waiting for the opportunity to accomplish that goal those goals but constantly constantly working i should have given up a thousand times uh i'm just too i'm, I'm too stupid to smart but i'm dumb you can't give up because there's always that possibility that's waiting, you know, somewhere around the corner or something like that. I actually wanted to ask you, what does it take to be a successful at the movie business? But, you know, I, I don't know, because I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not successful at the movie business. I, I, it's it's my it's my living. But, um, you know, I have I have actor and director friends that are like, dude, I'd give anything for your career to not have to have a side job and just be able to sustain myself acting and directing and writing and whatever they're doing, tap dancing, whatever they, they might be into. Um, I'd give anything for your career. How do you do it? And then I, my given response is, I have no idea because I'm nowhere even close to where I want to be. Um, I haven't accomplished a single one of the goals that I set out to accomplish when I moved to Hollywood. And I'm way closer right now than I have ever been, but I still haven't accomplished a single goal. I have never been a series regular 
on a television show. I've ne never directed an episode of episodic television. I've never sold a t television pilot and I've never been the lead of a studio movie. And those are the four goals that I set out to uh, accomplish when I moved to Los Angeles. Now, I've accomplished a ton of stuff and they're all on the way to getting there. But if I moved to Hollywood and two weeks later, somebody would have been like, dude, uh, you're the dude. Um, I wouldn't be nearly as good and have the longevity that I'll probably have when somebody finally gives me the time of day. I have a friend, uh, I won't say who their name is, uh, but they are one of the most handsome people on the planet. Like girls would run into street poles when he walks down the street, he's so handsome. And he and I moved to LA around the same time. We were in a commercial together right when we started. And for whatever reason, he got an audition for a pilot like two weeks after that commercial and booked it and became the series regular on a TV show. And he's possibly the worst actor ever. Ne not good, has never gotten better. Um, really, really bad actor, but he's accomplished one of my big goals, but he had it handed to him. He never struggled. He never worked on his craft. Granted, he was working and acting when he was on that TV show, but you know, I don't think he was in acting lessons. I don't think that he was seeking the advice from trained professional actors that were really, really good that he was acting with because he thought that he just had it figured out and he's not getting marvel movies and stuff now because he's really not that good and if he would have had my career and built up craft as it were uh he might be um chris pine or chris hemsworth right now because he's handsome enough to be he just doesn't have the talent and he doesn't have the talent because he didn't struggle so i think there is something to say for struggling i hate struggle i hate struggle i am so gosh damn sick of struggle that I, if I never had to struggle another day in my life, I would be the happiest person in the world. But I will say that it has made me better in every way, shape, and form. So, but I hate it. The looks, it's not talent. It is. It's both of, the, of those things. You have to have looks. You have to have talent. Um, but if one is given so there's 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 three metrics well four metrics looks talent luck and connections yeah if you have connections you almost don't need the other three um ron howard's daughter does not need any talents or good looks she will be successful in film and television because her dad is fucking ron howard um, I don't have any connections. I'm autistic and I'm so bad at networking, it's painful. Um, I have no luck whatsoever. I'm the most unlucky person in the world. I'm, I'm like a camping seven or eight. I'm like a Hollywood five as far as looks. Uh, but as far as talent, I think I have that enough to make up for all the other three because I work my ass off. <laughs> That's just one person opinion. Uh, Ron Howard's daughter might say something totally different. You have no idea what it was like to struggle like I have. You don't know what it's like to be given this gift of a career without working for it. Or I worked for it and no one saw the struggle because they just see Ron Howard's daughter. So every everybody's fighting their own battle. And, and I'll never know what it's like to be Ron Howard's daughter. I'm sure her life is terrible and great at the same time. My life is terrible and great at the same time. So what are you going to do? You usually say it's a burden when you got a famous name, and especially when you compare it to your more talented parents or, you know, brother, sister, or something like that. But again, all the doors are open to you immediately. So you don't even need to send your, you know, CVs or whatever, how to say it. Yeah, so, that is very true yeah. statement. I want, you to, I want to know, how did you make that transition from wanting to be an astronaut to going into movie mm -hmm. business? Super, super random, but it all built on itself. So my great uncle, uh, Truman Landon, where I got my name, uh, he helped start the Air Force Academy with Eisenhower. He was a test pilot with John Glenn. 
he was he flew the he, he led the B-17s into Pearl Harbor as it was getting bombed. So very deep military pilot history in my family. And I grew up with my grandmother always telling me the stories of his uh, heroic military career and said, I would give anything to have a pilot in the family. So I always knew I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, I always knew that I wanted to be an astronaut, which is something that he never got the chance to even uh, apply for. So uh, I went to flight school. Uh, I fell in love with flying and physics. Um, I became a test pilot for NOAA, uh, flying whale protection missions in a test aircraft, a military O2. Uh, and then when I had enough hours, I got hired as an airline pilot for a year, which gave me all my jet hours. So then I had all my test pilot hours, I had all my jet hours, which is what uh, NASA required at the time. And then NASA decided they were only going to hire military test pilots. So that made that degree useless. So I went back to my academic advisor and I said, well, what do I do now? And he said, well, I have it on good authority that they are doing and slating a mission to Mars and they're going to send somebody from the arts community to represent the arts community because the arts community has never been represented in space. And space is a boondoggle. You've got to um, beg for every penny that NASA gets, they have to beg for it. And they thought by sending somebody from the arts community, it would drum up a lot of public support for the mission to Mars and money would flow in. So I applied to conservatories uh, and I ended up getting my MFA in filmmaking. Now I'm autistic and growing up, therapist told me, look, you don't feel emotion uh, to help you understand intellectually what's going on with people's emotions. You need to start acting. So I was in community theater when I was a little kid uh, to help un to help me understand people. So it's not a total shot in the dark because I was already a good actor because I've basically been acting since I was a little kid uh, trying to fit in with people. And so because uh, I'm a little weird autistic kid deep down, um, I've learned through therapy to squash that. But uh, at the end of the day, um, I ended up getting into conservatory. I got my MFA in filmmaking and right in time that my NASA application had been filled out and ready to go because I had it from the test pilot standpoint, minored in physics. Uh, and then I had an arts uh, background. They canceled the Mars mission, just straight up scrapped it. So that made both degrees totally useless. So then I went back to my academic advisor again from undergrad and I said, well, what do I do now? Um, and he said, well, now you got to get your PhD or your MD. There's no other way around it. So luckily, uh, my undergrad program uh, had a fellowship program uh, that was automatic. If you're going to get your PhD, you're automatically in. So I didn't have to jump through all the millions of hoops uh, that most people getting their PhDs had to do. I uh, got all my prerequisites done and basically did uh, my PhD, uh, self-study, a lot of telescope time, a lot of coding, uh, astrophysics data to fit computer modelization. Basically, when you get your PhD in astrophysics, you become a computer programmer. That's really what it is. It's figuring out how to write a program to interpret the data that you get from James Webb or the Hubble or whatever, um, and then figuring out a way to make it fit a, um, a hypothesis that you have. Um, and so uh, on my graduation day, the defense day for my PhD dissertation, Obama put a 10 year hiring freeze on astronauts, cut NASA's budget, made all three degrees totally useless. So at that point, I'm like, well, I know I don't want to teach physics at university. I know I don't want to be a test pilot and I definitely don't want to be an airline pilot, but Hollywood seems interesting. So I packed up my car, I drove out to LA and I started making films. Have you ever considered being an advisor on those sets when they're making some science fiction movies or space exploration or something like that? Yeah, but all of those positions are given out to people at MIT, UCLA. They have to be indoctrinated at the collegiate level and then filmmakers will seek them out because that's their field of study. I'm not doing astrophysics anymore, so no one in the astrophysics community knows me. So I, I didn't establish those connections. So it's like, why am I not a test pilot for film and television? Well, the, the people that fly, like all of the jet pilots for um, Top Gun, that's all they've ever done. All they've ever done is fly 
test pilot missions. So when Hollywood wants a test pilot, they're going to go to the people that do it for a living. I could fly any of the airplanes from Top Gun. I could have been a test pilot in any of those, flown totally fine. But since I'm not a test pilot for a living anymore, no one knew to sought me out, seek, seek me out. I never got an audition for Top Gun, and I think it is the greatest, greatest uh, tragedy in the history of cinema. Like, because the actors in Top Gun, like, I know it grossed a billion dollars, but fuck were they bad. Like, their acting was bad because they're not real pilots. Like, send out a casting notice looking for real test pilots who act. Like, they would have found me, and I would have killed it in it. But that's just me being sour, probably. So that's how it all uh, culminated in me sitting here talking to you right now. <laughs> what movies inspired you to stop chasing movie making? Hmm. It's a great question. Um, I am not a cinephile. Um, there are people like Quentin Tarantino and Tom Cruise that literally spend all day just watching movies. Uh, memorizing what the greats did, um, breaking down every shot. Yeah, you yourself. Uh, breaking down every shot. Uh, taking um, you know Alfred Hitchcock as gospel. Um, seeing every single nuance that uh, Steven Soderbergh and Scorsese and all of the great, you know, Wes Anderson, breaking down how they did it to so that they have an endless catalog of um, ideas of how to do it greats by studying the greats. I never did that because I never wanted to be like the greats. I wanted to be me. And you can't be yourself if you study what everybody else is doing. Uh, I have a comedy uh, channel on YouTube that steals my ideas all the time, all the time. And I finally sent them an email and I said, hey, can you just do me a favor and stop watching my stuff and see if you can do this on your own? Like, there's no reason to take my stuff. I love that you're stealing my ideas. I think, you're, I th I think your execution of them is great. But like, why don't, why don't you try to come up with your own ideas and see what happens? And if they suck, maybe don't fucking do it. <laughs> um, and so that's my outlook. I'm not going to sit down and study film till I die, uh, till I can't keep my eyes open because I don't want to knock anybody off. I don't want to accidentally three years down the line be directing something and be like, oh my God, Quentin Tarantino had this great idea and I want to knock it off. I don't want to do that. I want everybody else to say, man, that Landon, he's doing stuff no one's ever done. And the only way you can do stuff that no one's ever done is by not watching what anybody else has ever done and just do it yourself. And that's what I've done since day one. Excellent. Now, I'm not saying that I don't watch film. Uh, I obviously watch movies, but I, I, I try to watch them and forget them as quick as I watch them. I can see you're mostly oriented to comedy. Why? You know, what's the reason? Drama's easy. Drama's too easy. Comedy, I, I am very, very drawn to things that are hard. Um, astrophysics is very, very hard. Uh, comedy is very, very hard because it is so subjective um, and it's constantly changing. Uh, drama, I can make anybody cry. It's the easiest thing in the world. You build a little emotional connection and then you take that connection away. Tears. Yeah, that's hard. Uh, but comedy, man, that's a moving target and I, and I really like the challenge of it. Plus, probably somebody told me that I was funny when I was nine and I never forgot it. I mean, I'm I am a human. Mm -hmm. Well, I have the same experience because I write satire, short stories, funny things, and I do those short, funny videos, not like you. I just use some inserts from movies and, you know, connect them and create something funny out of it. So but, what, drew, what drew you to film? Why are you so passionate about studying I've the I've always loved movies. You know, I was really young when I started watching them, and then I started analyzing them, not in a way that you describe with Quentin Tarantino and others, but I wanted to be an actor. You know, that was the first passion that I wanted. I actually wanted to be a detective or something that I realized those are not real policemen, you know, those are just actors. Then I wanted to be like them, you know, so, and then I started, you know, doing recitals and all kinds of stuff at school and some theater experience, you know, but 
it ended with this. So this is still something that's connected with movies, but not really making them the way that I wanted. Then I started writing and directing some short movies. But like I say, at this point, I'm just happy that I can communicate through these social networks and create some content that could be interesting to people. You know? So what's stopping you from acting? Well, you can't really... Well, the same thing you said about you. I have no connections. Um, neither, neither do I. I still don't have any connections, and I've been doing it for 15 years. Yeah. But if 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 you're not cold emailing agents, if you're not working on your reel, then you've given up. Yeah. And I and I strongly urge you to never ever ever give up. I mean, the the advice that that I always give i don't like to give advice i like to give perspective per but my perspective is that if you want to be doing something go fucking do it those who say it can't be done should not get in the way of those that are doing it that's my favorite quote um if you want to be an actor as soon as we hang up from this call go act go shoot something that's good and then add it to your reel and then send it to agents like never ever 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 give up and never stop ever ever stop chasing what you want to do ever never settle either because yeah. then you'll only be 50 percent happy about their dreams the moment they grow up and for me it's kind of sad because like i say you hear them they want to be something and then you can see you know you went one compromise then another one and they end up you know doing something completely different yeah i don't believe in compromise at all in any way shape or form unless it's a financier and the financier says my daughter will be the lead or your film will not be financed and that happens a lot uh in that case then i'd weigh like does she suck because i'm not gonna put i'd rather not make a movie than have a shitty actress be the lead um but that's the only compromise i would ever be willing to make but most people don't have to compromise. They just do. And they should not. Because then you're only going to be 50% happy. You know, when you love movies that much that you even make bad movies, but they become cult classic over time because you have The Room. Time. Yeah. I mean, The Room was is considered one of the worst movies of all time. And exactly. if, yeah. if James Franco wouldn't have gone around uh, sexually harassing people, he might have won the Oscar. It was a great role, and Tommy, I, I mean, it looks like he made something like that on purpose, but he was completely serious, you know, it, it, it's great to turn something that was basically a drama, and it's a heartfelt drama, into a comedy. Yeah, and, and Tommy is one of those classic examples of, he got success, success, if you want to call it that, he got it too easily. He had money beforehand, and he funded his own film without learning how to be a filmmaker. So he had instantaneous success because all he had to do was just make a film. And he hadn't struggled. He hadn't been a PA. He hadn't, uh, 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 what is that called? Uh, shadowed any great directors. He hadn't spent a ton of time making his own comedy sketches or, or drama shorts or anything like that. Um, I've made well over 200 comedy sketches well over 200 and it wasn't until comedy sketch 80 or 90 that they oh there we go now i got you back yeah, we're back we're back good did you hear anything that i just said no not really just okay I I, yeah. I I i was basically just saying that tommy found success too quickly and too easily so the product uh suffered now, I'm not saying that there aren't people like Shirley Temple that weren't brilliant performers almost straight out of the womb, because there are. Um, but she also worked her gosh damn ass off. So. Yeah, so we know it's good to chase your dreams, but is there a, how do you say, it? can we sometimes find that pot of gold under the rainbow without going through so much pain, you know, something like that. Go. No, mm. I don't. Th well, I mean, that's probably the cynic in me. Um, I have another buddy 
I will say his name, Brian Deaton. He's a, a series regular on NCIS. Brian is one of my very dear friends. Uh, he plays Jimmy Palmer on NCIS. I love him to death. Uh, he and I met on set. I said like three words on his TV show and we bonded over golf. Brian uh, was in theater from a young age, really cared about it. And then he went to college for theater and worked his ass off in college and always got the lead roles and everything. And people were really jealous and mad that he always got the lead. And then... Um, somebody said to him once like how lucky are you that you just keep getting all these lead roles and he was he told me the story he was pissed because he was working his ass off for it and then when he got to hollywood he like booked everything so he, nobody saw all the work that he did from childhood all they saw was oh you moved to hollywood and you're just killing it as soon as you got here well, yeah, that's because he had already put in his dues. Nobody saw the struggle. And I guarantee you that, if, this will be funny, if I end up, for whatever crazy reason, one of these comedy sketches that I do blows up, like let's just say it's the Texas kid, the Texas baby, ends up being a thing. And then a producer sees it. And he's like, we've been looking for the son of, of Jeff Bridges in these movies and you look enough like him and you do that little Texas thing that Jeff Bridges does and it is perfect. You're going to play the opposite of Jeff Bridges in this movie. And then we go to film festivals mm -hmm. and people see my performance and they're like, Landon, where did you come from? Like your first big movie role, you came out of nowhere. And I'd be like, fuck you. I have been killing myself. 15 years of making film to get to be an overnight success. And then there are legitimate overnight successes, which is infuriating. Um, and some of them deserve it and some don't. And everywhere in between. Life's a spectrum, right? Just like autism. Well, actually we can say life is uh, like algorithm. Well, the luck in life is like algorithm. It just picks you up at some point, you know. You hope. I mean, yeah. you hope. You hope. But, I mean, the Texas baby, I, uh, my two biggest viral comedy sketches, both of them, I had to be talked into doing them because I'll come up with an idea, write it down in a notepad and be like, eh, eh, okay. And then it's not until uh, jean Viev is like, hey, you should film a comedy sketch today. And I'm like, well, here's an idea and here's an idea and here's an idea. She's like, that one. And I'm like, that one's stupid. And she's like, that one's going to hit. And I'm like, that one's stupid. I don't want to do it. And she's like, just do it. And then I do it and it blows up. Um, then I'm like, you never know. Like, you just never know what, that's why I love comedy. Is like, you just never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to blow up. It looks like that someone, uh, sometimes you have to tone down your humor in order to be more presentable to broad audience. Yeah, it's, it, I always hesitate away from doing topical things because I don't, it's too easy. It's just too easy. When I see a comedy sketch or something blow up because it's like, like, hey, mom, you're too overbearing. Oh, my mom's overbearing. It's like, give me a break. That, that's not even smart. It's not smart or funny. And people yuck it up. Thank God, this Texas baby, it's my version of it, so it's smart. Like, the baby speaks very intelligently. Um, the baby, you know, like, it's my brand of humor, and I'm glad that people appreciate it, but also, it's kind of topical, and I don't really love it. So I did a few comedy sketches before that with deep thoughts with a Texan kind of thing, and I think they're way funnier than the Texas baby ones. But they didn't take off at all because they're not topical at all. They're just talking about ridiculous stuff that I think is very funny. But the sketches didn't do that well because, you know, the parenting stuff, people were like, oh, that's my kid. And it's like, well, that, you know, you got to tell a story that people care about and they resonate with. Right. I the best movies are things that people resonate with. Right. Yeah, exactly.
I mean, for it's whatever like, reason, yeah. people resonated with Barbie. <laughs> yeah. The movie that I haven't watched yet. Or Don't. It's favorite. unwatchable. Yeah. yeah. I watched Oppenheimer, so that's... that's I did too. I, I want to have it, yeah. Did you like Oppenheimer? Like I said in my review to my audience, it is a good movie, but it's definitely one not one of the best Nolan's movies. And it's Yay! That is correct. Yeah. Beautifully shot. Cinematically beautiful. Exactly. And the music Shitty was storytelling. Fantastic. You know, everything. And the acting was top notch and everything else. But it's I... not interstellar. It's not inception. It's not even the dark night. I thought Robert Downey Jr.'s acting was uneven, but I think they shot it out of order. Yeah. So, like for me, it head. wasn't one of his best movies. It wasn't even in top five, but there's a good chance he'll win an Oscar for it. So, that's it. Oh, I'm sure he will. For sound design, if nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> of course. But it wouldn't be well, his Oscar. Um, I wanted to ask you about your comedy skits, you know. And the first thing that I watched, you know, that's the way how I discovered you was an excellent choice, sir. And it was fantastic. It blew me away, you know, how funny it was. How that it was is funny. one that I did not want to film. I got in costume mm -hmm. and I told Jean Viev, um, I've changed my mind. This is very stupid. I don't want to do this. And she said, you're already dressed in the waiter uniform and you got the camera out. Just film it. If it sucks, it sucks. I'm like, it's going to suck. It's not, not funny. I'm not doing anything. It's not smart. I don't want to do it. And she had to force me at gunpoint to film that comedy sketch. I still don't think it's funny. I have, I ask everybody that likes it, why do you like it? It's not good. And no I one's given me an answer that makes sense. I actually have a reason why I liked it because please watch the fast show. It's a British comedy show from 1990s and 2000s, early 2000s. I think it's called what against? Fast Say show. Fast show. No. Paul Whitefield. And he was, I think, Taylor. And every time, you know, the guy comes and tries the suit, he said, Oh, suits you, sir. Oh, suits you well. Oh, so well. And even Johnny Depp was a big fan of that show. And he was a guest in one of those episodes and he was trying, you know, a suit or something. So it immediately reminded me of that. And I was a kid when I watched it, you know. For me, it was fantastic to see that again. And I actually thought that you were inspired by it. No, I never heard of it. Yeah. Well, no, in fun the funny thing is, is um, after, the, after the sketch went viral, uh, if there is such a thing, because viral is wildly differing uh now because i mean if you go look at like lionel messier's uh or messy or however you pronounce his name um any of his instagram reels like they get 50 million views because he has 150 million followers so like is that viral i don't know anywho um uh what what some people called me out on um as it started to go viral was there's a brian regan stand-up routine where he does a thing about waiters saying, uh, I, I don't know if it's excellent choice or maybe it is. Maybe he literally says excellent choice. I think he literally says it. And I'm sure, because I love Brian Regan, I had completely forgotten about the sketch. And this brings me up to my previous point of trying not to knock people off. So don't watch what other people are doing. Um, I completely forgot about that. And at some point in my life, I am sure I had memorized the line, excellent choice. Uh, and I, I didn't do it like Brian did. I did it in my own way. I did it in an Australian accent and I, and I, and I did it like they were, they were at a, after a golf tournament. So like, it was all my own spin. Um, but that's probably where it came from, is from a Brian Regan stand-up routine that I forgot. That's my guess. I don't, I don't know. I wrote it in my in my notepad and I found it and Jean Viev was like, just shoot it. So I There's a saying that when you have an idea uh, when you have an idea, there are six people more in the world that have the same idea. So it's important to be first to present it. I'm sure there's way more than six. Yeah. And then and I'm sure there's people that are kicking themselves after they watch my Texas Tot, like if you just call it that, they're like, that's so easy. Like yeah, it is easy. A little Texas toddler, you know, so.
Uh oh, my phone's ringing. No problem. I'll call her back. So, um, yeah, I think with ideas, there there is nonstop good ideas out there in the world, which is why there'll never be the end to cinema. Is everyone's going to have their own spin? Why do they keep remaking movies? Because they sell. People like stories that they're familiar with. I think it's awful. I, I miss the days when movie studios made 100 movies a year as opposed to eight that they make now. But what are you going to do? I think the problem is they think because people like movies from the 80s and 90s, they think if you bring back those old actors now and you have the same script and you just throw them in in this modern society and it's going to be funny, it's going to work, people are going to like it. And you have the, these modern generations who... They don't care about these old actors. They don't find it interesting at all. And they like old movies just for the sake of it. You know, it's retro. It's interesting. It's in. It's not nostalgia. They just like it because it's in. Yeah, I, I think they like old movies because those movies were good. Yeah. I mean, why, why, do, why do you like any movie that you like? You like it because it's good. Um, and movies now aren't necessarily all that good because people aren't doing new, fresh, fun, great movies. They're remaking J Jumanji twice. Now it's gonna make an absolute boatload. You put The Rock and tiny little Kevin Hart in a movie, people will go to it. And what is the movie? It's movie business. You gotta make money if you're making movies. Like why would anybody donate their money to make a really great movie that will not make money? No one like that's 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 donations. No one's gonna donate money to the film industry. That doesn't make any sense. Make something that's gonna make money. It's you know why do people mine gold? Because gold is valuable, and they need to make money. Like nobody just goes out there because no, you've never met a gold miner that mines gold because they really like the color of gold. I like mining, they yeah. want money, and it makes sense. And I'm not faulting them for it. Now I have a lot of scripts that I've written that I think are not only. Good, I think they would make a lot of money. Now, I'm no one and have no connections, so they probably won't get made until I have money or connections, but what are you gonna do? I've, I've had people, family members, be like, hey, can I give you money to make a movie? And I always tell them no, because I think it's a terrible investment. Now, if it's a, a, a film fund or somebody with so much money that they can stand to lose it, then I'd be like, okay, if you realize that you are literally donating $15 million to make a movie that you may not make a penny on, then I'm happy to film this movie because I think it'll do well, but just go into it expecting to lose every penny. That's how people need to look at filmmaking. For lots of movies, you even ask yourself, how did this movie get made in the first place, you know? Every wow. one I see. Yeah. I can't think of a movie that I have watched recently that I haven't asked that question. How in the hell did this movie get made? Like, this is the movie they choose to make? This is the movie they put $50 million behind? And it's gonna be one of the two things. It's gonna be somebody had connections or somebody had money. And they probably had connections with money. And That's it, it's, it's not working your money. Yeah, if it's a superhero movie, it's gonna get sold, you know? It, it gets old, yeah. Yep. And yep. we don't That's even right. know why, because when you even when you ask these younger generations, they are not really into those movies anymore. No, no. I mean, you know, tides are shifting, tides are changing. I wrote, I wrote a musical all about the space race between the Americans and the Soviets in during the space race, and the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, had a verbal agreement with them to produce the musical. I moved my family to Colorado to do it. And three months into the partnership, they backed out of their deal because the female students decided there weren't enough roles for them. And the musical theater department and the faculty at the University of Colorado at Boulder uh, breached their contract with me simply because the female students said that they didn't want to do it. So when you've got that kind of pressure uh, that, that colleges are caving to their students, 
But could you imagine the students saying that 10 years ago in front of a, you know, a musical theater department that really believed in what they were doing? Like, people are fucking cowards. They're cowards. Cowards nowadays. But a lot of it's really good. Like, women do deserve to have a voice. I don't disagree with that. I don't think it should have made them not do my musical and back out of their agreement. But at the same time, like, I get it. Like, Women do need to have a voice. So I, I support it and hate it at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I said it many times about strong female, char- uh, female characters. If you, that character fits the movie, then it's fantastic. You know, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to be first in line to watch it. But if I notice, it's kind of woke. If, you, you, if, the, if they look... If it's fitting watch- a narrative. Yeah, exactly. If they're superior to men, you know, I can't watch it. It's impossible for me to get it, you know. See, I could get behind that movie if it's told in a very interesting, cool way. But if it's told from a soapbox, get out of my face yes. with your agenda. I don't give a shit about anybody's agenda. Let me get lost in a story. And if and if you if you frame your agenda in a really great story, that is what the Nazis did. And other people throughout the course of human history. That's what Abraham Lincoln did. That's what, you know, Abraham Lincoln wanted to free the, Abraham Lincoln actually didn't want to free the slaves. He wanted uh, the states to choose, but nobody wants to talk about that. Um, If you can get your message done by telling the best story, then your story is going to get told. I haven't told a good enough story to make good enough connections with the right people. Now, I'm also a homebody and autistic, so I'm terrified of people, so never the two shall meet. Man, that was a weird diatribe, and I brought up Nazis, and I'm sorry about that. (laughs) Anti-Nazi. No, I remember the movie Erin Brockovich, you know, and you have strong female character, you have... It was fantastic to watch Julia Roberts in that role. So there wasn't a single moment that you don't say, ah, she's not able to do it because she's a female or something. She was strong. She was a leader. And it was based on a real woman who was a fighter. So it's it's fantastic. A mother, family person. And when you see that, you can't even question something like that and say, you know, they are not good enough for it. And like I said, there aren't, you know, men or female, men or women or how to say stronger or weaker sex. We are all the same. We are all equal in a way that some of us are better at certain things. So, yep, there are women that are far more brilliant than men. There are men that are far stronger than women. There are some women that are stronger than some men. I mean, it's just like you have MMA fighters that are female and they could kick everyone. Um, Yeah, yeah. yeah. For example, Gina Carano, a lot of them. So, yeah, I'm sure as shit, I'm sure as shit not picking a fight with Ronda Rousey. I'll tell you that much. Absolutely. And we know it. Like I said, if you don't. if you don't want us to question the logic of that movie, you should use them as the, you know, leading characters, leading ladies in those movies. But again, you know, I wanted to ask you more about the writer's strike. Do you think it's going to affect movie industry at all? Because we already has a lot of those remakes and everything else. And, you know, it's all available already. Hollywood chases trends so um taylor sheridan the guy who created yellowstone let's just say that he shopped yellowstone for a year and never could get it made because nobody wants uh nobody cares about a rancher nobody wants to know nobody cares about a a rancher in montana or wyoming or wherever they were like they're in montana No one cares. So why in the world would Hollywood produce it? Well, Paramount decided to produce it and the show blew the fuck up. And as soon as it blew up, sorry for cussing, as soon as it, but I will cuss much, much more. As soon as the show blew up, what happened after that? Every single network wanted a Western show, every single one. And that's gonna be true across all human history. No one wants a book about a wizard, especially a child wizard. 
and then Harry Potter blows up. Now everybody wants all wizard IP because it made a ton of money and everybody wants a piece of their market share. Um, that will never change. Hollywood made superhero movies. And as soon as a couple of superhero movies bomb, no one's going to want to make superhero movies because they're not making money. People are making superhero movies because superhero movies make a shit ton of money. People rush out for the gold rush because gold makes a shitload of money. People start space race companies because space race makes a shitload of money. Like wherever there's a shitload of money, a shitload of people are going to be flocking to it. And whatever is risky, people are going to be terrified until somebody becomes a billionaire from it. Then everybody's going to want to do it. Are writers in danger of AI? I talked to one of my friends who works in AI about this, and he said that all that AI can do is regurgitate what a programmer puts into it. Because we're not at the singular, singularity. Um, and you're never going to be able to replicate just how messed up the human brain is. Um, can you tell... In fact, I've done this. Uh, I don't have chat GBT or anything like that, but Jean Biev does. Uh, and one day I was like, hey, tell chat GBT to write me a comedy sketch with two golfers that are talking about a sand trap or something like that. And what it spit out was so, so bad uh, that I'm like, ugh. Do I, do I think that AI will write a better movie than a person? No. Do I think it ever will? Probably not. If it does, will I not watch that movie simply because it's written by a robot? Absolutely not. I would watch the best movie ever written by a robot in a heartbeat. <laughs> if it's a great movie, like who doesn't want to watch a great movie? I don't care how I'm entertained, but I'm autistic and I don't have that precious bone that some people have like, well, it's costing people their jobs. You know, it's like uh, the, 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 the assembly line with the Ford Model T. It's like, well, think about all the workers that aren't. And I'm like, I don't care about those workers. Like they should find a different job because their job is no longer useful. Like don't keep the assembly line uh, an automotive worker. Don't, don't, don't not have mechanization where you're reducing stress uh, the amount of money it costs for materials, you're lowering the price point for consumers. Don't not do that just because some people won't have jobs. Find a different, you know, thing to earn a job in. But I'm not precious in that sort of way. I don't care if people lose their jobs if it makes something cheaper, more efficient, and less dangerous. Lose your job. I don't care if writers never write another script because computers can write better scripts. If computers can write better scripts, then people shouldn't be writing scripts. They should let the computers do a better job. But I'm not precious about it. I'm literally saying I'm okay if I if I lose my job, if a computer can do it better, then the computer should have the job. But I'm autistic. And that's probably an unpopular opinion. But I also don't care if it's an unpopular opinion, because it's the truth. I actually think the best way to test AI and its creativity is with comedy. I actually tried with Hot Shots Part 3. I asked the AI driver. <laughs> it wasn't funny. There were some no. okay jokes, but they were too familiar. You know, I saw this somewhere. You know, I've seen it. It's not able yet to recreate our sense of humor. No. And, and, and I don't know if it ever will. If it does, then great, because I love to laugh. Yeah. Like, when I watch a stand-up special, I do not care who wrote it. As long as the person who's delivering the jokes is funny, that's what's funny. You know, it's like, I always find it funny that, like, whoever delivers the line is the one that wrote the line. You know, it's like, oh, McConaughey, I love it when you said blah, 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 that movie. McConaughey's initial gut reaction should be, well, all I did was say it, I didn't write it. But he says, thank you so much. Like, love that line. You know, almost taking credit for something he did not do. All he did was regurgitate something that somebody else with creativity said. Now he put his own spin on it and McConaughey hated it and made people want to watch it, um, which is great. But writers are unsung heroes, for sure. Absolutely. And I'm also interested, what do you think about 
deep fake and voice cloning, is it going to change Hollywood forever? No. I think it's fascinating. Like, who doesn't want to see, like, somebody deep faking Donald Trump getting hit in the nuts with a baseball as a toddler? Like, I'd watch the shit out of that because it would be hilarious. Um, now, when people are making deep fake porn, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's when it gets gross. Like, mm, mm, when you're starting to just to disparage people at their expense, I don't love that, but because I was a product of bullying, people bullied me relentlessly growing up. So hiccup or maybe a burp. I'm not sure what that was, but it hurt. Um, I apologize. Excuse me if that. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't want anyone being made fun of or anyone suffering as a result of. But that's obviously where it's going to go. So do you stop it entirely? Do you just say no more? of that because people will misuse it no people misuse literally everything people literally misuse everything people misuse guns people misuse sugar people misuse cars people misuse love people misuse religion like there is nothing that does not get misused and if you just take i mean nuclear weapons probably should take those off the planet like take those off the planet but like short of that no matter what you make someone will find a way to abuse it so probably some actors are going to sell their looks, you know, resemblance as an IP to some studios at some point. Yeah. Good for them. Make your money. Yeah. And I also want to ask a few questions about golf because both of us like golf and that's the way. Bring I'm it. Connected. Yeah. So you see how I, do you see how I lit up? Yeah. Yeah. What is your favorite golf movie? Boy. I always ask PGA Tour pros this question. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite golf movie, Legend of Bagger Vance. Ah, excellent. Excellent choice. <laughs> it's excellent choice. Yeah. Uh, it's perfect. It's just the perfect movie. I can't watch it again because Will Smith. Yeah. Well, it's not spoiled to anyone else. Yeah. I know. And it's sad because I've, I've golfed with Will Smith and he was just the nicest person in the world. And I think his wife is so toxic for him and ruined his life, but also like, God, you can't assault people. Anywho, uh, Legend of Bagger Vance. Legend What's your favorite golf movie? Happy Gilmore. <laughs> what is it? Happy Gilmore. Oh, Happy Gilmore. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I loved it. And when I was a kid, when I watched it for the first time, that's why I liked golf. You know, that was the reason to start liking it. And I love it. There are great movies like The Greatest Game Ever Played and Bobby Joe's Stroke of a Genius. Have you ever wanted to write a script for a golf movie? Yes. Badly. Mm -hmm. And my buddy Brian Dietzen from NCIS, we actually talked about this, of writing a golf movie together. But we kind of agreed that every great golf movie has been done. Like, what is the barrier to entry to writing a great golf movie? Well, there's really only three or four stories in golf. The washed up tour pro, 10 cup. Mm -hmm. The come out of nowhere and be an instant overnight success, Happy Gilmore. Mm -hmm. The person who had greatness and kind of lost it, Legend of Bagger Vance what other stories are there to tell like those are kind of it the only other one that has not been told is a caddy does something mm -hmm. like it's told from the caddy's perspective but everybody wants to see it from the hero's perspective so like how do you make it about the caddy and 10 cup kind of did that yeah. so because i mean cheech marin was a huge part of 10 cup story but i you know it's like I don't, I don't know. I, I had the idea of, so I am somebody that uh, I'm a plus, I'm a plus handicap. If I shoot over par, there must have been a tornado. I could probably play on the PGA Tour, but I hate, hate playing in golf tournaments. 
I exclusively golf by myself because I don't like golfing with other people because golf is where I go to find solace. And if I go out and shoot a 60, I have a course record at a place where PGA Tour pros play, the um, uh, Colorado Golf Club. It's where they played the Solheim Cup. And I have the course record there. I would never want to do that in a tournament because I don't like uh, competitive golf. I don't like it when people watch me play. So I thought it would be very interesting if somebody like me, let's just call it a savant of golf, was forced or coerced into playing in front of people against their will. Like they lost a bet or their mother was on their deathbed and she's like, you have this gift, you have to go do it. And then he ends up winning this massive thing for his mom and then just like, imagine that an amateur qualifies for the masters and then wins it and then never golfs again. Like, that's a really interesting story. That's the only golf story that has not been told that I think would be really cool. I actually had one idea and I always wanted to make it, but you know. Hit me, what is it? A, how about a golfer who's losing his sight and at the end of the movie, it's completely black and he feels, you know, holding golf club. What do you think? I'd yeah. watch that movie. Me too. I'd watch that movie. Yeah. And mm. I always had a scene in mind, you know, when he's a kid and holding a golf club, he's laying in the grass, you know, and just doing like this at the night sky. And at the moment when he does like this, there's a shooting star and it looked like he hit it. Yeah, yeah. I like it. So if you were in Hollywood, the pitch to that one would be it's Ray, but with golf. Uh -huh. Sure. Where, he, where as he's slowly becoming blind, he slowly has to find ways to adapt with it. Yeah. Be like, baby, nobody's going to be there for you. You're all on your own, you know. And that but ending who, scene, you know, when everything's black and he just, you know, does it by the feel, you know. Yep. Imagining the, the golf ball just going to the green or something. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Hmm. I like that idea. I played with a guy the last time that I got partnered with a total stranger. He kind of like came on. <laughs> he had no social grace. He was funny. He's autistic uh, as well. He came out. Uh, I was on the tee box. I'm like, hey, when can I go golf by myself? And they're like, at noon, go ahead. Uh, you're the only one on the tee box. So I went out. I got on the tee box. I was about to hit my drive. And then this kid with a bum arm. He had one good arm, one arm that was totally useless. Uh, he just kind of like trudges up and he's like, Hey, you mind if I play with you? And I'm like, fuck, I guess he ended up shooting under par with one arm, one arm shot under par. And it's like, what? You know, so it's, there's cool people out there. Yeah. I'm, I think it'd be interesting. Yeah. I'd watch that blind movie. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds interesting. And write it. Why aren't you writing it, you lazy sack of farts? <laughs> I've got a lot of things going on. Uh, that's it. Like I said, oh, you, you some... got to work on your priorities, baby boy. <laughs> Sometimes you have to make those compromises in a way. But like I say, at some point, I'll probably put it on paper. But I wanted to do it myself. That was the thing. You know, I always wanted to act. That's send it. me this. Send me the script when you're done. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> they relax to together or something. I think I think funding a golf movie would be the easiest thing to do in a world. It's just so hard to come up with a good idea that hasn't been done. Because, like, the great golf movies have already happened. So Maybe great. I'm just not creative enough. <laughs> I don't think you're, you, feel in the, you, you fell in that category, I have to say. Because there are a lot of people who don't have any ideas and all they're making all kinds of movies out there. And it's sad. <laughs> And, that's the truth. and so true. I can also ask you a few questions about Dicky Sledgehammer. Yeah, your short movie. Okay. The breakthrough movie. Yeah. So, so, so uh, that's about an that's about an autistic detective uh -huh. whose world uh, is in his head. So there's the world of Dicky Sledgehammer, and then there's the real world. So it's just this, this autistic detective, detective that takes his world 
very, very seriously, but it's all make believe because he's he's me. Uh, he's he's autistic. So the lens through which he views the world is totally different than the lens through which everybody else does. So um, that's a movie that I wrote for ever ago it sat on my hard drive for years until somebody was like hey i've got all this film equipment and i'm like oh i've got this short that i've wanted to film for forever and he's like well you can have all my film equipment uh let's make the movie together so he produced it i wrote directed and starred in it and then it won all types of film festivals and then uh i ended up um getting uh, uh it was up for oscar voting so we were, we were not nominated for an Oscar, but we were in the running to get the nomination because you have to win really big film festivals to get the opportunity to get voted. And it was either my film or this other film called The 11 O'Clock and The 11 O'Clock ended up getting it and they deserved it because it was incredible. It's best short film I've ever seen in my entire life. Josh Lawson made it. Do you usually send your short movies to film festivals or? I don't make shorts anymore. So the interesting thing was after after the Oscars were over and I didn't get the nomination, but the 11 o'clock did, three weeks later. So I'd win a big film festival and then the 11 o'clock would win the next festival. And then I'd win one and then they'd win one. So it was going to be his film or mine. Three weeks later, I was on set of a movie. And who was the lead of the movie? But the kid who wrote, directed, and starred in the 11 o'clock. And I'm like, dude, you got nominated for the Oscar. What was it like? Like, how, how, how much has your life changed? He said, the day after the Oscars, he was with CAA because he's famous. The day after the Oscars, an agent, another agent from CAA called my agent and said, congratulations on your client getting nominated. And that was it. That was the only thing that happened because, from his Oscar nomination. And it's at that day that I said, I will never make another short film for the rest of my life. There's just no reason to. Do you think if it's not going to do anything for your career and you're never going to make money doing a short film, why do it? Mm -hmm. I'd rather make I'd rather make sketch comedy that will get actually seen by people and appreciated. Well, do you think that this short comedy videos will get you somewhere closer to Hollywood in a way than anything else? Yeah. No, I I don't see this as my vehicle simply because I've been doing it for so long and it's I think it'll make me a better filmmaker it'll make me a better actor it'll make me a better comedian it will make me a better writer it will make me a better director and all of those things are not nothing but what it will not do is get me discovered like a producer for Marvel isn't gonna see this comedy sketch and be like that Texas baby guy Mm -hmm. that's who we need acting opposite of Chris Hemsworth, no matter how good it is. That's just not how it works. And can you recommend some movies that everyone should watch if they want to go into movie business? Yes. I think one should watch the movie Downsizing. Uh, it's an Alexand Alexander Payne movie, and you either love it or you hate it. And I, I love it. Loved it. Loved because it. one of the characters is Dushan from Serbia. He's so good. He's so good. Um, but I thought the person who played Knockland was, I think she deserved an Oscar for she best. Was fantastic. Yeah. She was unbelievable. It's the best female performance I've ever seen. So nuanced, so brilliant. Um, so that movie, uh, the movie Cabin Boy, if you want weird, quirky, autistic humor, that's a Christopher Elliott movie. It's the only movie that David Letterman has ever acted in. I thought that movie was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I think Wolf of Wall Street is a movie that everybody should watch at least once because it's cinematic brilliance. Um, I think I think Leonardo DiCaprio overacted in it. Uh, and I think everybody else was brilliant, but I don't think Leonardo DiCaprio was good uh, in that movie. I think he was okay, but not but not brilliant. I think a lot of other actors could have done better. Um, and those would be and Christmas Vacation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it is the perfect movie. Do you like Chevy Chase? I love Chevy Chase, and I'm friends with Chevy Chase's daughter, and Chevy Chase was supposed to do a rapid-fire interview, and his daughter ended up getting used by someone that she met off of Instagram, and her family was like, you're no longer 
uh, like, we're not going to let you keep getting used by people. And I was never using her. I met her off of Instagram, but, um, that dick bag who really hurt her feelings, um, is the reason why I haven't gotten to do a rapid fire with Chevy Chase, but I want to so bad. Yeah. I love that, man. I mean, Fletch for me. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. He's, he's a tortured artist. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're back. Uh, I was saying that Chevy Chase is one of the best physical comedians ever to have existed. Yeah. We agree on that. We agree. Uh, what else? What else can we talk about? It's... Well, we can talk about science fiction. When you watch science fiction movies, oh, do you have any of them that you can say, you know, to... let's put it this way. When you watch a science fiction movie, do you say, it's all okay, you know, it's all right, and they did it, they got it, they understand it, they understand the matter. Or you say, what the hell is this? What are, you know, is this a joke or something? Second one, yeah, I can't suspend disbelief. Like, everybody thinks that my favorite movie is going to be Top Gun, but I'm like, they went after Burners for three straight minutes, they'd be out of gas. Like, mm -hmm. I, can't sus I can't suspend disbelief. Like, Interstellar, the one unforgivable thing that they said was, we solved gravity. It's like, fuck off. Give me a, you solved gravity. Give me a gosh damn break. So, no, I can't. I can't. I can suspend disbelief if I know nothing about the thing. But, n n no, I can't. I can't watch sci-fi, sadly. What movie is the best science fiction movie ever, you know? ever made what do you think which one? Oh, god uh district nine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. district nine or arrival probably one of those two mm -hmm. just because okay. they didn't get into the science like aliens existed they were on the planet earth um for district nine uh aliens arrived and they were trying to communicate in their own special alien sort of way like those were cool um Oh, I really liked Passengers, too. Passengers yeah. is a movie that had and lost its financing nine times. Nine times they funded and defunded the movie Passengers, starting in like 1995 or something crazy. That script had been around Hollywood forever. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And I think they got it, you know, and they wait for the right time. Because oh, they killed it. Was yeah. Amazing, breathtaking. They, yeah. Yeah, they killed it. Yeah. They killed it. I loved it. What do you think about 2000 Space Odyssey? Too disconnected. <laughs> it's there's like three different movies in it. And that's why I didn't like uh Oppenheimer. Like the whole movie could have been about the trial. Mm -hmm. The whole movie could have been about the bomb. The whole movie could have been about the love story. And they tried to make the entire movie about all three. 2001 a space odyssey is about two or three different things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what, do you what think did you think about it dude it was visually stunning agreed uh, it took me like four times to get it you know how to say it. at least four times because i like to watch movies several times in order to analyze different uh, how to aspects of it you know all right film buff cool. what's the greatest movie ever made for me alien alien yeah, for me. The original uh, original Sigourney yeah. Weaver? Yeah, for me. So you like the horror genre? No, it's more like science fiction. And I'm a big fan of Ridley Scott. He's my number one director. Yeah. But yeah, still, the movie a, had it all. Okay. You know, it was suspense. It was horror. It was visually stunning. And science fiction acting. Everything was on the spot. And I... I... Okay, go ahead. Those claustrophobic movies. So Aliens was amazing. It was fantastic. I loved it. But the first one in that confined space, you know, like they say, you know, in space, no one hears your scream. It was amazing. I actually uh, think that the newest version of Alien was very, very fascinating. Uh, even more so than the original. I forget what it's called. It's totally blanking. What's the newest Covenant. alien? Covenant. Give you. Okay, not that one. What was the one before that? Prometheus. Where? 
Prometheus. That's the one where they're on the alien planet and stepped on like the puffballs and then they got it in their mouths and then they became the aliens. Was that Prometheus? Yeah, yeah it was in Prometheus. Yeah. I thought Prometheus was brilliant. Anywho, opinions, yeah. perspective. And I asked you about the Blade Runner. What do you think about Blade Runner? He's on my top 10 list of all times. I never saw it. I still haven't seen really? it. Really? Nope. The newest one or the, the old one, one? The newest one was also great. But I said, uh, the newest one is a beautiful replicant. But original is still original. You know, that's... Haven't, haven't seen either. Really? Do you, know what, do you know what they say is the only perfect movie ever made? Back to the Future, they say, is the really? only perfect movie. Excellent. Isn't that interesting? The original, Back to the Future. And I actually like the second one more than the first one. I do too! Yeah. I do too, I love the second one. I love the it's second got one. That feeling, it's a wonderful life, you know, the only darker version of it, yeah. Oh, I love that movie. I love It's a Wonderful Life too. Man, if you don't cry at the end of It's a Wonderful Life, yeah. Yeah. you're probably autistic. What are your top 10 movies of all time? Top 10? Yeah. Downsizing. Mm -hmm. uh, Cabin Boy. Um, Legend of Bagger Vance. Mm -hmm. Christmas Vacation. Man, you're putting me on the spot. Uh, oh, man. Um, those are the only four movies I like. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look at my DVD collection. I'm not somebody who just knows these things off the top of my head. I really like Inception. Not Inception, Interstellar, but I don't want to like it. Um, but I kind of did. Um, uh, Iron Eagle? Oh, yeah, really? Yeah, I know. It's a weird one. But, like, a 15-year-old savant pilot? Like, yeah. come on. How do you not like that? Excellent. That's amazing. Excellent. Because I watched it before Top Gun. So for me, it's, you know, I like it more in a way. Oh, yeah. 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 Good Will Hunting, because I like uh, math auteurs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I really liked the Intimidation game. Um, I think that was fascinating. Uh, I really like Fury with Brad oh, Pitt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Peanut Butter Falcon. Just because Shia LaBeouf, oh my God. Like, I have dreams that Shia LaBeouf and I are best friends. I think we would be best friends. Um, when I was in LA, I, I barely ever did extra work. But a couple of times, like, somebody would call and be like, we really need a really tall person for this thing. And the rate is $800. And I'd be like, well, I like $800. And so I'd go and do it. And there was this one random day where they needed a really tall person to bump into Shia LaBeouf. So I'm like, I'll do that for 800 bucks. Then I never ended up bumping into him, never ended up getting called to set. And I was just sitting on the curb and Shia just comes and sits right next to me. And he, this is in his ultra fame of being the lead of Transformers. Like there wasn't anybody that didn't want Shia LaBeouf in their movie. And he sat down, down next to me and we talked until a PA drug him away a half an hour later about everything. From that moment on, I'm like, Shia LaBeouf and I are gonna be best friends. And then he went back to his trailer and I'm like, hey, can I go leave Shia a note? And they're like, obviously fucking not, you moron. Did you just ask us, can I leave Shia LaBeouf a note in his trailer? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, no, we were talking for a half an hour. And they're like, yeah, I'm sure you were talking to Shia for a half an hour. But like, yeah, I love Shia LaBeouf. That's why I make those uh, Shia LaBeouf sketches, just because I'm in love with him. I'd give anything to be best friends with Shia LaBeouf. Do you know Shia LaBeouf? Not really. I watched it. Well, that that's a shame. Well, if you ever become friends with Shia LaBeouf, let him know that that one autistic kid that he talked to on Transformers for a half an hour. I will uh, definitely uh, remember. Really wants to be his buddy. Famous people. Who's the most interesting, aside from Shia LaBeouf? Most interesting? Yeah, most interesting. Not just, you know, best actor or something. Most interesting in person, you know, when you talk to them or something. Boy, interest is very subjective. Like, my buddy Brian Deaton and I have had very interesting conversations 
uh, had very interesting conversations on set about golf. Okay. Uh, I worked with Robin Williams. I thought he was the most annoying human being on the planet. I couldn't couldn't wait to get away from him. Uh, he was the most I couldn't stand him. Uh, I had a long conversation with John Travolta uh, about airplanes. I thought that was really cool. Minnie Driver and I almost went on a date and she's super sweet until I freaked her out because I over pursued her. Uh, same thing with January Jones. I, I wicked over pursued her. Uh, but like, I think she's interesting. Uh, my buddy Vincent Carthizer, who is a series regular on Mad Men. I think he's a really interesting dude just because he started off as a child actor and he's really, really goofy. Um, and I just think his perspective on life is so fascinating. Um, I don't think there's very many people that get to the level of success that fame is without having really good stories. But when you really get down to it, you know, there's no famous person that I've felt vibed with that isn't just a person. Like if you take all their fame, all of their all of their wealth away and it's just two people having a conversation are they a good conversationalist like are they cool yes. are they cool to get the along with i asked about interesting you know i want to know aside from that fame and money everything else you know yeah then, then I, with, yeah then i would say everybody i've never met a well one person the lead of csi miami was just an absolute dildo to me uh david caruso um, he was just a dickhead to me for no reason, for literally no reason other than to be a dickhead. But other than that, like there are a bunch of people that are professionals that are doing their job and they've got really interesting stories and they're really nice. I don't think there's a famous person that I met other than David Caruso that wasn't cool and interesting. They're all just people doing their job and they're interesting. Now they get their ass kissed for it, but at the end of the day, uh, I think they're all just, I think they're all interesting. In their own ways. If you reach that top of success, what kind of movies would you like to make aside from those golf movies or something? You know, what what do you think would leave a mark in the world? Honestly, my musical uh about the space race between the Americans and the Soviets is if I got my musical made and I became the next Lin Manuel Miranda, I would retire after that and I would never act, direct, or do anything again. I want to make one really great thing that I'm proud of that makes me super rich and I never want to work again. I want to travel and hang out with my kids. I always had that same idea, you know, making a movie and getting an Oscar for writing, for acting, directing, producing, and you just, you're done. Yeah, like you make Goodwill Hunting and then you retire. That's it. Yeah. I, I don't, I love, I love this business, but I love life more. And this business is not life. I, I am not sustained by, like, when I'm on set, I love it. I love it. That's why I want to be a series regular on a show. But I don't think anybody knows if they want to be an actor or not until they become a lead of a movie or the lead of a TV show. Because that's fucking acting. Or the lead of a Broadway show. Like, that's when you determine whether or not you really love it. When everything is on your shoulders. You are carrying the show. You're carrying the movie, you're carrying the Broadway production. Like, that's acting. The rest of it's performing and being silly and make-believe. Who are your favorite actors? Philip Seymour Hoffman. He was one of my professors. Uh, he's unbelievable. Uh, Shia LaBeouf. I, I, the, the way that I answer that is, who has never put up a bad performance? Mm -hmm. Shia LaBeouf has never put up a bad performance. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman has never put up a bad performance. Tom Hanks has put up a bad performance, but he's very close to never putting up a bad performance. Um, uh, um, me, mm -hmm. I, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever phoned in a performance. Um, and if you're not your biggest fan, who the, who the hell's gonna root for somebody who doesn't even believe in Excellent. themselves? Um, and that's, that's about it. There's only like two or three actors that are uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, but I, eh, you know, 
he does heavy drama. I want to see Daniel Day Lewis do comedy. Then he can have my respect. I recently had a discussion about Daniel Day Lewis. When you say, you know, I'm inspired to become an actor by someone, you never say Daniel Day Lewis. And it's interesting. You never mention his name as one of the greatest actors of all time. And he is. But he is. Yeah, he is. But you never say, I want to be like Daniel Day Lewis. You know. That's, be, that's I mean, he's a character, he's a leading man character actor and nobody wants to be a leading man character actor. Like they want a, per, they want like, oh, I want to be Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He's the yeah. same person in every single movie. Dwayne has zero range, mm -hmm. but the thing that he does is great. So people want to be Dwayne The Rock Johnson because they can wrap their head around it. They can't wrap their head around the brilliance of Daniel Day-Lewis mm -hmm. of, creating entirely different human beings. Like his Abe Lincoln could talk to Bill the Butcher and how fucking crazy of a conversation would that be? But if you think of two, two characters that The Rock played talking to each other, it'd be like, you mean The Rock talking to The Rock? Oh uh, yeah. You mean The Rock and Jumanji talking to The Rock from Black Adam? You mean the same person talking to themselves? like? People can wrap their head around that. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody mentions Daniel Day-Lewis just because he's so brilliant. Yeah, for me- But he's, he's unapproachably brilliant. Philip Seymour Hoffman was approachably brilliant. Daniel Day-Lewis, unapproachably brilliant. All school actors like Sean Connery, Gene Hackman, Harrison Ford. Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, yeah. For me, those legends are, they created the acting in a way that we know today. You know? with their nuances and everything else. Mimic, you could see that. Even when you watch those old movies from 1930s or 40s or something, and when you see Humphrey Bogart or Clark Gable, you, you see that acting skill. And now it's just like it's lost. You can't see that anymore. You can't see those emotions anymore. They can't replicate. Right. I would agree with that. Yeah. But the, what the hell do I know? I'm not a film buff like you. Oh. You know more than I do. Yeah, but sure, sure. I'm a, especially about astrophysics. Nobody knows anything about astrophysics. It's all make believe. Yeah. We're just trying. We're just trying. We're just trying to do our best. Nobody has any gosh damn clue. James Webb Space Telescope is changing everything every single day. I'll use this chance to ask you about multiverse. What do you think about it? It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It can't. It breaks the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, now, depending on whether or not you believe in string theory or M theory, um, the multiverse has been posited, but there's there's no way to, it's mathematically possible, but it's impossible to test. Um, maybe every single time you have a singularity at the dot of a black hole, that begins a new Big Bang. So every black hole you see at the, at the quantum tunnel of the black hole at the end of the pinprick that is a new uh universe <laughs> so you know the the supermassive black hole at the center of the milky way galaxy maybe that has birthed a brand new universe <laughs> we'll never be able to test it ever so it's a waste of time that's theoretical physics and it's just it's untestable it's like it's like m theory and string theory how can you test quantum folds uh, without the instrumentation it takes to actually test. You can't. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's just mathematical masturbation. I have no time for untestable theories. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about wormholes? Is it possible? Math to or Yeah, it's certainly mathematically possible. You just need an energy source almost equivalent of the universe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it could happen. Uh, physics, as we know it, dictates that it can. Now, is there an exotic material that creates wormholes that we just haven't discovered yet? Maybe, but that's science fiction. And Untestable, mean, therefore, not worth my brain meat. <laughs> Will time travel ever be possible? No, that, that actually does break the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, but, theoretically... Um, time, time travel does exist. Just look up in the sky. You're looking 13 billion years in the past. 
unless you believe in the tired light theory and then maybe it's like 30 billion years old but who knows no way to test it right now um but yeah time travel exists just look through a telescope you're looking at things how they were 13 billion years ago so which traveling back in time can depicted it the best of all those that you mentioned oh contact <laughs> one of my favorites yeah love that movie so underrated so underrated so good so gosh damn good and um and uh even though jodie foster is a little unsettling to look at uh in some of those scenes gosh damn it is her performance brilliant i'm okay to go uh, do, do, do you okay me uh, i'm okay gonna go it's like oh god that just hits me in my fucking soul i actually have a theory that contact is prequel to interstellar love that idea love it i mean there's also a movie if you haven't watched it i'm mother with hillary swank the movie with the robot in a dystopian future yeah. where it's like ushering the baby and then she and ends I up think killing it's equal to interstellar that's my theory oh that's interesting yeah i am mother <laughs> man that is a movie that elicits a response doesn't it mm -hmm. yeah it makes you feel something yeah i mother's a great a great film a deeply unsettling but yeah. great yep i agree with you there mm -hmm. and who is your favorite writer or screenwriter there well uh, uh aaron sorkin would say himself you ever heard the quote aaron sorkin said the best movie that's ever been made is somebody uh filming him slowly turn the pages of his own script <laughs> i heard about <laughs> isn't that funny um best best writer i think one has to say whoever wrote my favorite movies whoever wrote downsizing whoever wrote um cabin boy chris elliott whoever whoever wrote um the legend of bagger vance i want to know what do you think about the godfather you're gonna hate me i've never seen it really i haven't seen any of them i've never seen godfather i've never seen star wars almost unfor almost unforgivable yeah, i realize that especially if you're a uh, movie maker and you haven't seen them yeah yeah i haven't seen some of the best movies of all time i haven't seen godfather uh i haven't seen gone with the wind mm -hmm. i haven't seen a bunch of the greats but um they're not genres that that draw me in like i don't like violence i was bullied enough growing up that i do not like violence and the godfather is deeply violent i watched like 20 minutes of casino and it upset me it was so violent i have no interest like the departed you couldn't pay me money to watch that movie i don't care how brilliant it is i don't like violence not like i like like saving private ryan violence but like real world somebody hurting another human being no time i've got no time for it and what the about godfather say again Star Trek. What do you think about Star Trek? I've seen five minutes of one of the movies. I've never seen a single episode of the television show. But the funny thing is, is about a week ago, I promised myself that at some point I would watch the first season of Star Trek because I'm sure I'd love it. Because it's interesting, it's set in 21st century. And there is no money, and the whole existence of you know humans is to explore, to discover, to make connections with you know parts of the universe that we haven't seen before. So, yeah, do you think we'll ever reach that level to be that kind of human beings who just want to explore and not just to make money and you know have belongings or whatever? Well, you have to be able to make money from it. Um, th there has to be a way human beings are too stupid to see that eventually the sun will expand enough that it will envelop earth and the, if our species is going to survive we have to become a space faring, faring civilization there is no way around that earth will be enveloped by the sun now it's going to happen in a few billion years but um if we don't find a way 
to download our conscious being into a positronic brain and shed our, our biological bodies, we will become extinct. We just will. Um, if there's a way that we don't conquer outer space, we will become extinct. The chances are 100%. Now, are we worried about it in 2023 uh, when right now we're just facing global warming and not the extinction of our species? No, because, because why are we worried about billions of years from now? People are stupid. I think we should increase NASA's budget by 7,000. I think we should dissolve all world militaries, dissolve all world militaries, like all world militaries, make every form of munitions illegal except for hunting, <laughs> and donate, give every single penny that we would have given to the military industrial complex to NASA and space agencies. And holy shit, would we thrive as a species. But people are fucking dumb. People decide to start wars. People need to worry about their fears and people need to worry about people like Putin and King Jong-il. Uh, now, if the world was just like, we're, 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 we're evaporating all world militaries. There is one world government. Um, all munitions are illegal. Um, people would be like well that's dystopian it'd be like well it's dystopian now theoretically like do you think you're gonna beat the army you're not gonna beat the army so what's the difference if the army was the world army versus the united states army if we you know shed all borders but it takes a great thinker to think that way and then it takes a very stupid person playing on the fear to talk somebody out of it yeah i talked about anarchy lots of times because it was intended to be a utopian society and people don't get it they always think about destroying everything you know civil war or something like that but it's not it should be you know just living without governments and creating we are here to create and yeah i talked to a, i talked to a lot of astronauts when i was writing my musical and the one thing that they said that was true across all astronauts is you want to change your entire perspective about life go into outer space. You look down on the earth, the one thing you don't see, a single border. Exactly. It's just a planet. And they said, if we could get every major world leader to orbit the earth a couple of times, there would never be a war again. And I truly believe that. Yeah. But people are stupid. And so that'll never happen. Yeah, in that way, yeah. I have to agree completely. And it's sad. Yay! Yeah. And just to ask you, what do you think? Will we colonize Mars anytime sooner? Yeah, I think it'll probably happen in the next 30 years. Maybe not colonization, but I certainly think that, I think the first, first people that go to Mars will die on the mission. Uh -huh. um, and they may die on Mars, possibly, but it's a very dangerous, very dangerous trip. Uh, you know, when you get outside the Van Allen radiation belts, there's just nothing to protect you from the radiation from the sun so your exposure to cancer is increased tenfold um um there's no resources there um well polar caps but um yeah uh i think our first thing is a permanent moon base finding a way to um fuel our probes and future missions with the polar caps on the moon, finding liquid water and then making hydrogen fuel out of it. Cause it's just H2O it's, you know, that's rocket fuel right there, hydrogen. Um, and then using the moon as a kickoff point. Once you get out of earth orbit, we can be way more efficient with the one eighth uh, moon gravity versus the earth gravity. And then we can come become a better space faring civilization because we must, otherwise we are dead. So was so, yeah. Martian with Matt Damon scientifically correct when you represented all of yeah. So the interesting thing is, is Mike or Andy Weir, when he wrote that book, wrote it as a serial. So he wrote it one chapter at a time for the internet. Mm -hmm. And then each time he wrote a new chapter, he got the scientific community to fact check all of his math, mm -hmm. uh, maths. 
And he wrote the book that way. And then when finally there was a producer or a book publisher that realized how popular that was, and he got the rights to his book published, his book was scientifically spot on, just dead nuts accurate. The amount of hydrazine it would take to create the catalyst, to uh, make water, the amount of dirt that he would need to create potatoes, the amount of oxygen he was using, like all of that was stupid scientifically accurate. The amount of light that was being absorbed by the photovoltaic arrays, um, the the G-forces that he would experience on launch, like super accurate. Because it was written as a, a real life science fiction book, which is why The Martian was so, I'm gonna put The Martian on my list too, it's one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Um, and Ridley Scott, so there you go. Ridley Scott. Um, yeah uh and uh yeah so yeah it's super scientifically accurate because it was literally written to be scientifically accurate do you know any more movies like that that you could recommend that are as scientifically accurate as the martian nope mm -hmm. sadly there there are some movies that get f physics the physics of space right like 2001 space odyssey like they have the centrifugal mm -hmm. uh force things so th they would have artificial gravity um uh but you know they uh, gravity was somewhat accurate um they 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 took pains into making it as sci scientifically realistic as possible now the amount of time it would take for the orbital debris to destroy everything that was wildly off so some of the physics and astrophysics was wrong but you know it's it's a movie. And that's the unforgivable stuff. Like, I can't, I can't get behind the physics of how long wrong gravity was, but I could get behind Sandra Bullock's emotional journey of like losing her friends and then, be, you know, lit, crash landing on Earth. Like, that's interesting. And of all those actors, directors, writers, who are your role models in? I don't, I don't have any. You don't have it. Don't have. I don't look up to anyone. Not a single, I would never put a human being on a pedestal. Yeah, but in a way, I would like to make something similar, you know, I, not just in a career, but I would like to do that character that way or to write a book like that or something, you know. It was that if, good. If, if I write something that's like somebody else's because I'm enamored by them, I am the worst writer in the history of writing. I you've you've touched on something that i am diametrically opposed to i would never want to make something like somebody else i want everybody else saying that about me be like man landon did this and how earth shatteringly different was that that's what i want to make that's also a commercial success i don't want it to be earth shatteringly good that nobody watches what good is that to do anybody so no one inspired you to become certain of those crafts you have to say Nope. I'm on my own journey, baby. I look up, I look up and want to uh, emulate no one. Fantastic. I there's respect. fascinating, there's fascinating people that I've met that I'm like, I man, guess. that guy's cool. But I have never in my life once said, I want to be like that guy. Now, if you were like, gun to your head, who do you want to be like? I'd be like, Ben Stiller. I want to write movies that I direct and act in. Like, but I don't want to be Ben Stiller. I don't ever want to be Ben Stiller. I don't want to be Ben Stiller at all. But if I got to write movies and direct them and star in them, that'd be cool. Like, I'd love to have one blockbuster and then never work again. That would be great. I want to go hunt in the mountains of Montana. I want to go find a trophy bull elk that feeds my family for the winter. That, to me, is a greater journey than any movie making adventure would ever be but i would also never want to be a guide for elk hunting uh so i don't obviously love it that much <laughs> and one last question what do you want your legacy to be? my musical <laughs> if i'm remembered for anything i want it to be for my musical telling the story of Michael Collins as the unforgotten, as the forgotten astronaut of Apollo 11. And at the end of the musical, 
the lead character encourages everyone to set a goal bigger than themselves like Kennedy did, where the entire populace of the United States has to get behind one great big idea that nobody thinks is possible. And if my musical does that, Earth is better. I want to make Earth better in a real way. I don't want to make it in a small way. I don't want to just recycle. Mm -hmm. Give me a fucking break. I want to, I want to change the world. So you want to inspire? Uh, no, I want to be the change. Because if you think of inspire, like you think of, oh, think of all of the other people that you got to do all of the work. I want to do the work. I want to be known for the work. Mm -hmm. But do you like, would you want others to start working on them because of you? Who doesn't? There are some people that only think about, like I say, profit, fame, everything else, and they forget about that kind of legacy. When you're dead and you still keep inspiring people to do something and to work on themselves. That's Well, I, I reserve the right that when I become, if I become, I will never become, but that's fine. If I were to become rich-er and famous-er, I reserve the right to want way more of that but right now where i'm sitting in this chair mm -hmm. if i had fame and unbelievable self-made wealth i would today retire never work again if i had 40 million dollars in my bank account and everybody knows my name i would never work again and if you wanted to meet me i would be sitting under a tree somewhere looking for a bull elk amazing it's a wonderful it's and flying, exactly. flying airplanes and yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. It, this was a, an amazing conversation. I'm so glad we had it. I think, I've, en I've enjoyed it. Yeah, I think everyone who's gonna watch it, not entirely, but at least some portions of it will get how important things we discussed today and how amazing can life really be if we understand it correctly. Yeah. And, it's all about perspective. I might have it totally wrong, but it works for me, right? Yeah. And movies are an important part of that. Movies connect so. people and it's art at its finest. That's it. You know. Amen. So everyone from Filmolovats is very thankful for your time. And I enjoyed it tremendously. If we can do it sometime again, it would be amazing. But now you're becoming too famous, so everyone go check on Instagram, Landon Nash for directs. It used to be good golf, bad golf, right? It did. I went through a brand change. I don't know why, but one ra randomly one day, I'm like, good golf, bad golf. If I blow up, it's really not really say anything. It's not going to help my career. So I changed it. Yeah. Well, it was the right time. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for this. I hope we'll have another one, one of those brainstorms again. So enjoy your fame, your, your success, and be even more famous than you are. And Sean, thanks for being thanks for being nice to me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I love you, Doctor London. I love you too. <laughs> See you soon. I hope so. Yeah.